uh, I received the question um, if it is possible for a shaman to really intervene in the path of another person or the destiny of another spirit. Um, and the answer to that in short is yes. Um, in shamanism it is very much ultimately about authority and about power. And if you have enough authority and power, you can do things. Um, if you want to do things on such a level that it will actually yeah, change a person's life path, then you also have to have power and authority, not merely in the, in the lower parts of the cosmos, in the worlds of form, but you will also need to have power and authority in the formless cosmos, where actually the elements which yeah, constitute the fate of a person exist. Um, as to whether it is wise or good to do that, that is a whole different issue. Um, it's a little bit of a tricky thing, because ultimately the, a person's yeah, path will tend to unroll itself. A person has an intention, and while the person has that intention, they keep on creating an energy which will manifest itself. So if I want to be rich, and I keep on wanting to be rich, ultimately, maybe after several incarnations, I will be very rich, because this energy is just building, and ultimately, it will manifest. So in that sense, a shaman is powerless if the other person doesn't change their intention. So I cannot stop that person from ultimately becoming rich if they keep on putting energy and energy into it. I can keep on trying to block them by putting more and more energy into it myself, into blocking that. But it's like an arms race and ultimately the person who can hold on to their intention the longest will ultimately have that intention manifest itself. So there is in a way a limit as to what you can do and in some way it is also self-defeating. So if a person would want to be a little bit rich and just be comfortable and I don't know have his little house, his little car and his little garden and I start blocking this person and keeping them in a very poor state, their desire to have this money, to find this money, to generate this money will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And in the end, when this person might overcome my blockage, then the person will not merely have his house, his car and his lawnmower, but he might turn out to be a multimillionaire and be exceedingly successful either in this life or in the next. So it is not that useful to try to prevent another person's manifestation because unless the spirit decides for, to do something else it's only a matter of time and getting a spirit to change its mind well that is a bit beyond most shamans because the spirit itself is free it has its own free will and having its own free will by definition, it is not under the shaman's control. A shaman can control the manifestation. So, for instance, the spirit might want to have the experience of having a life of luxury, but a manifestation of the, of the, the soul, which is incarnated in a body, has certain thoughts, has certain tendencies, has certain abilities. And those, being much on a much lower level, can be influenced directly by the shaman. So the shaman can, for instance, remove certain abilities or to block certain thoughts or to um, block certain energies coming to that person. And that will, of course, create a very frustrated spirit. But uh, the spirit will only be able to remedy that if it is strong enough to overpower the influence of the shaman. So the incarnated part and the lower parts of a being are under a shaman's control, but the higher parts of a being are not. If you go against a person's spirit, that spirit is usually not going to take very kindly to that. 
So uh, the spirit will start looking for allies and start trying to build up a resistance to the blockages which are being imposed upon it. Um, it's actually the same with disembodied persons. So also another spirit, for instance, a person dies or an animal dies, the spirit wants to move on. It can be trapped by a shaman and the shaman can make it into an object of healing or summoning and can make the skin into a drum or can use the bones for, um, yeah, for healing or the feathers. Uh, so it is very easy for a shaman to overpower the spirit of another animal, to trap it and to use its abilities. But ultimately the soul of the being which you overpower is not always going to be very happy with that. Ultimately it's going to try to rebel and it may take thousands of generations before such a spirit on a relatively low simple level will become a more powerful human being than you, but why breed enemies if you don't have to? So I'm a rather lazy shaman. I believe very much in following the path of least resistance of using a minimal amount of force. And if a person agrees with you or a spirit agrees with you, then you can actually cooperate on getting things done. Because often a person's spirit can be so weak that it actually has no control over its own inclination. It cannot control its the thoughts which are going on in its body. It, they cannot control the health of its body. It cannot control uh, the emotions of the body. So ultimately a spirit can be a little bit like trying to ride or tame a wild horse when it is trying to deal with its incarnation. And the shaman can offer valuable aid and support to the spirit in taming and developing the incarnation so that the incarnation can serve out, um, can help to serve the spirit, attain its purpose in its incarnation. And often if you build that type of a report with other spirits, those spirits will also be very inclined to uh, give you some help or give you some tips. They might not be very strong or capable, but they can be your eyes, they can be your ears, and they will contribute what they what they can and what they have. And if you have you can have one very big strong friend or you can have thousands of friends who are more remote and all contributing a little bit. And both systems will work with giving you additional abilities and additional support as a shaman. So I prefer a process of cooperation than a process of competition. I know that in some shamanic cultures actually this process of competition is very much encouraged uh, because also the humans in these cultures tend to be very competitive and well uh, whether this is new for you or not shamans tend to well try to either rob each other of each other's power or to kill each other or make each other sick. It's a rather violent um, tradition. Um, so having friends is very important in shamanism. And being feared and being respected is also very important in shamanism. Um, so you have to, in a way, find a very good balance for yourself. That people won't think of you as weak, powerless, indecisive, um, and yeah, just a wimp, a follower, because this will multiply your enemies if you uh, show weakness. On the other hand, if you're a tyrant, also people will ultimately try to unite against you and your own allies, given the chance to break free of your influence, will also join the enemy camp. And for anybody who studied uh, how communist China came to rise, well, then you will know uh, if you try to use soldiers whose hearts and minds are not really in it, uh, they will very quickly join your enemies and become your foes. So you can lose allies and have them turn into foes by not being respectful enough of those who serve you. So being a shaman is very 
similar to being a king or a queen. Yes, you have power, yes, you have authority, but unless you really take care of those you govern, as if you don't see them as your yeah, as your body, as your responsibility with you at the head, then you will have a rebellion on your hands eventually. And of course you can postpone this rebellion by becoming stronger and stronger and taking their power and keeping people from yeah, gaining enough power or influence to challenge you. And then you get a little bit of a Stalinistic regime as a shaman. And as we all know, Stalin was very powerful, a very successful person also energetically extremely skilled and powerful person. But in the end there is always a limit to power. Um, so you're in a way by breeding enemies you're also challenging yourself, you can accelerate your growth. Um, but it is not always the wisest thing because it is you can very quickly rise to very high levels by just having a process of colonization and process of conquest and then everything you conquer makes you stronger so you can conquer more. Uh, but ultimately the overhead of keeping control over all your colonies, uh, over controlling your imperium, will also slow down your growth and ultimately you will tend to become stagnant again. If you go by a much slower process of in a way allowing people to join you becoming part of your, you could say, confederation um, where each has yeah, their own needs, their own voice and their own needs are met, they have their own freedom, then you don't need to spend so much time on controlling the, yeah, you could say the internal politics and then you can focus more on the external politics. So your initial growth will be much slower but you won't hit as strong as a, of a threshold in the maximum size you can attain. So I hope this gives a little bit of insight as to uh, what is a wise way to, uh, to deal with disturbing other people's power. Um, so short term effects, yes, of course, you can do so. On the long term it tends to be counterproductive. But the long term is a really, really long term. A capable shaman can postpone their demise for often five, six, seven incarnations even. And while still growing in power and power. But ultimately they will still hit a limit. But yeah, from the perspective of the incarnated person, they're more or less limitless. Because the limits can really go quite far. Um, another thing which happens, of course, depending on your behavior, is that you will tend to attract spirits of a similar behavior and your vibration will become that of a very similar nature. So if you as a shaman tend to compete, um, then you will tend to incarnate and to be surrounded by a very competitive environment. And in a way that's just the way environment is at the moment. But um, it's also possible for a shaman to cooperate with other spirits from nature and to, in a way, protect them, to give them shelter, um, provide guidance to the lesser spirits. And this will also put you in an environment where other greater spirits will also try to help you to teach you, just as you are teaching their smaller brothers. So this environment is much more cooperative. So depending on your strategy, um, you will find yourself in a very different energetic universe. 